So yeah, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kira Neller. Um, I, we met, what was it, last week? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So um, I had found the uh, iReceptor database uh, preparing for our, immuno, uh, our immunoprofiling um, project for, uh, for this hackathon. And uh, so I set up an account, I filled out the survey, told, uh, told the team what, uh, what we're trying to do. And uh, her colleague, Brian Connor, uh, reached out and said, hey, this is really cool. How can we help? And then I said, well, you know, we have this hackathon. And, uh, and so that's how we, uh, we got connected. And um, the database is actually pretty neat. It's, it's uh, um, one of the challenges in all of this work is finding data sets that are relevant and meaningful. And uh, iReceptor is uh, uh, <clears throat> working on that for, for these immunoprofiling data sets so that you can get things a little bit more packaged. Um, they've already been processed, so you can get to a different kind of um, question. They have analysis tools, and we're going we're gonna to see all of that. Before that, uh, Kara will give a little bit more of her background, but you know it's kind of interesting. So she got her PhD from um, York University in plant biology, plant genomics and is now working in a uh, immunology setting as a data curator. And so with that, why don't I turn it over to you and you can tell us how you how you arrived at that and what you do. Sure, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, happy to be here to be uh, telling you all about uh, the iReceptor platform, which I understand you've already sort of been poking, poking around at, which is great. Uh, my role uh, with iReceptor is I'm a data curator and also a bioinformatician. So uh, basically what I do is, um, so in some cases, I'll actually sort of reprocess some studies um, and sort of curate them according to these AIR standards, which I'm going to discuss, um, and sort of load up the data into the um, AIR data commons. And in other cases, sort of what we're moving towards is really sort of a consulting sort of capacity where we're working with, um, or at least in my in my role, I'm working with research different research groups to sort of help them um, set up repositories and basically fill it with data and um, sort of make sure all the data is um, standardized according to the guidelines and um, and standards that uh, the AIR community sets up. So I think I'll get into a little bit more of that in the talk, but if there's any questions, you know, feel free to um, ask after. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, I'll be talking about the iReceptor platform and its use in curating, uh, analyzing, and sharing antibody or B cell and T cell receptor repertoires. And in our world, this is called um, AIR-seq data. I think other, others call it immune profiling data. Um, so a overview of my presentation. So first going to give a background on um, immune profiling and its applications. Some of this will probably be review uh, or maybe even a little bit too elementary for you, but I just wanted to have something, some, oh, <laughs> some talking points in there. Um, then uh, getting into the, um, the AIR community. So the adaptive immune receptor repertoire community and the AIR data common. So the AIR community basically sets the standards and guidelines for working with AIRseq data, and then the data is stored in the AIR data commons. And then after that, I'll be able to tell you how iReceptor fits into that uh, sort of equation and how it makes it easy to access and analyze the data that's in the AIR data commons. And finally, just a few sort of um, screenshots and stuff and reviewing the different workflows and actually uh, navigating the platform. So uh, getting started uh, with immune profiling, what you're really trying to do is uh, look at the immune repertoire. And the definition of um, an adaptive immune receptor repertoire or AIR, it's an individual's diverse collection of antibody or B cell receptors, uh, BCRs, so antibodies are the soluble form of B-cell receptors um, and also T-cell receptors or TCRs. So this immune repertoire is incredibly diverse and this diversity is important because it enables uh, broad pr protection against all the different pathogens that um, an individual will encounter. So to give you an idea of some numbers, uh, humans can generate about 10 to the 13 potential BCRs and TCRs. And then at any one time, an individual has a 10 to the nine B cells and T cells. So you can really get a sense of how 
of just the immense diversity. And um, AirSeq or otherwise, which I'm using sort of synonymously here uh, with immune profiling, refers to these high throughput uh, sequencing techniques that capture uh, this immune repertoire diversity. And they have many clinical applications such as um, the development of vaccines, uh, drugs, so for example, auto in autoimmune diseases and cancer therapies, as well as really important diagnostics for uh, these sorts of diseases. So uh, I mentioned in the previous slide how this immune repertoire is uh, incredibly diverse. So one of the key processes by which this diversity is generated is through the process of VDJ recombination. So uh, what I'm showing here is um, a germline configuration of an Ig immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin or TR uh, T cell receptor gene locus. So this is pictured here at the stage of an early lymphocyte. So this is a sort of precursor of a, B, of a mature B cell and T cell. It has not yet um, encountered its uh, antigen. So within the um, DNA of this early lymphocyte, you have multiple V, D, and J segments, as well as um, different constant regions. And through this process of VDJ recombination, what you end up with uh, within the actual DNA is um, one V, one D, and one J uh, segment that are ultimately stitched together. And all of the intervening DNA between that is um, removed. So this is then transcribed, translated, and that forms um, one chain. And then the um, antibody or B cell receptor or T cell receptor ultimately has uh, two chains, but um, I won't get too much into that right now. But what I really want to point out is that um, this process of recombination, it's um, important because it creates junctional diversity. So due to the enzymes involved um, during this recombination, they actually introduce these non-templated um, N nucleotides. So they're not encoded within the, within the germline DNA at all. And you can see them here within the VDJ um, sort of spliced together um, uh, sequence. And these N nucleotides actually form um, in the protein, this important region called the CDR3. And this is the region of the mature uh, receptor that actually interacts with the antigen. So um, this diversity at this point is especially um, important. And I'll just note here that um, after we, you have a single V, D, and J joined together, uh, we call that a rearrangement sequence. So um, as you saw sort of in an early lymphocyte cell, um, that cell will undergo the process of VDJ recombination. And then through different processes um, within the body, so different sort of maturation and selection processes, um, and ultimately, when um, when a receptor actually encounters um, an antigen, there are these sort of editing processes that increase the level of uh, mutations, all for the purpose of sort of improving or optimizing the fit of the receptor against the antigen. Um, so, and in this case, this is just showing anti an antibody sort of a, a tree, a lineage tree. But what I really want to get at here is the idea of clones, and that these are sets of B cells or T cells that are descended from that um, ancestral cell, uh, the ancestral cell being produced by a single uh, VDJ recombination event. And uh, these sort of clustering or clonal clustering distributions are uh, really important um, for a few different ways. So if we sort of zoom out, um, and look at an individual who has, so we're looking in this case on the left-hand side, an individual with um, several different clonal clusters and a healthy individual will actually have their clonal clusters um, of uniform size and complexity. Uh, moving into the middle panel, when you have an individual that's been exposed to an antigen, um, those cells that actually contain receptors which um, interact with the antigen and bind, um, these will actually expand. And in the case of antibodies, they go sort of, they undergo this process of um, somatic hypermutation, which is really that sort of high level like editing process, which really optimizes the fit. 
And it's these clones, so the blue and the orange here in this case, which are really, which scientists want to use to um, identify for like vaccine candidates, because these are the sequences that um, an individual uh, is responding to and will use ultimately to fight the uh, pathogen. So this is sort of one case of the the repertoire diversity networks being really um, important. Another another example, and sort of not as uh, positive a uh, example, but in, in the case of uh, leukemia. So you can use these uh, diversity metrics and see that in uh, in this case, what you have is a very diagnostic result of um, a few dominant clones just having this incredible, incredibly complicated clustering. And um, so that's cancer, obviously bad news. Uh, good news, however, is that um, this repertoire diversity and the, the clonal clustering pattern um, can actually, and is actually used as a diagnostic, diagnostic test. Um, and just uh, to sort of provide um, a background onto the uh, immune profiling method. So there are many ways for these experiments to differ. But ultimately, they start from a sample of BRT cells. Um, you'll start with either a bulk sample where the um, the cells are in like bulk um, blood tissue or a lymph node or a tumor sample, um, and then isolate the genetic material, either DNA or RNA, in bulk. Or there are approaches to actually uh, purify single cells and then isolate the RNA from those cells um, in a manner that actually allows uh, you to associate the full um, RNA transcriptome of that cell with its receptor back to that individual cell. So it's a very um, powerful approach. And um, there's sort of two different methods to, and they have different pluses and minuses to them. Um, but anyways, after you, uh, uh, get the genetic material, what you're going to do is sequence it, uh, out pops the raw sequence reads. So these are the FASTQ reads. And typically they are um, stored at repositories such as the sequence reads archive. So this is just raw data. People upload their data there. And then uh, researchers will do different um, error co corrections or quality control and pro some preliminary processing. So basically identifying the V, D, and J um, segments that are in, in, the, in any uh, in the independent uh, rearrangement, and as well as those key sequence features such as the CDR3 regions. And this is, this is what actually comprises those TCR and BCR repertoires. And it's this which gets stored in the Air Data Commons and which iReceptor uh, tries to facilitate researchers finding and using this data to get um, insights. So what kind of insights can we get uh, from immune, uh, immune profiling? So I already sort of briefly touched on the, clone, the idea of clonal distribution, looking at those clonal clustering networks. Um, there are metrics for diversity and clonality, which are basically sort of opposites. So you have uh, something as highly diverse as in this right, uh, whoops, right cell cluster, then that means it has low clonality. Um, so you saw before how the distribution was indicative of different sort of biological processes. You can also track different clones um, over time. You can look at shared clones within an individual to see whether they are um, sort of, are they circulating in the blood? Are they in um, the lymph nodes? The in the case of um, antibodies, it's when the antibody is within a lymph node and has sort of um, interacted for the first time with uh, its uh, antigen. That's when that process of somatic hypermutation happens. So you're going to get those really um, high affinity antibodies. So some people like to sort of do those types of analysis. Another popular one is looking for these things called public clones. So these are clones that are shared among individuals. So if you have clones that are in um, both in, in all of your experimental subjects, um, that's interesting. As And then you can also compare to see, are these clones um, present in healthy individuals too? And you can get an idea of the frequencies and 
um, things like that. And finally, with the different um, clonal groups, uh, you can look at different sequence features such as uh, consensus motifs and look to see if there's any um, you, any biases in the V, D, or J genes that were selected within, you know, something like ver enriched clones. Um, okay, so that was my background. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too much uh, repetition from what you already know, but um, I'll move on now to discuss the, um, the AIR community and the AIR data commons. So the AIR community was established in 2015, and it's a group of um, experts in the space who are developing guidelines and standards to generate, annotate, and store this AIRSeq data. And the whole uh, idea of this is to, uh, or the goal of this is to facilitate its use by the research community. Um, and AIRSeq the, the, the ability to share this data really increases the value of any individual data set. Um, that's why or that's uh, the reason why is because these studies tend to be tend to have a very small number of samples. Um, however, there's a large amount of data per sample. So when you get multiple multiple of these studies together, um, it allows researchers to um, increase their effective sample size and therefore statistical power when they're making co different comparisons. As well, it allows researchers to have access to you know, uh, different um, samples that they may not have been able to include in their particular experiment. So how the, the AIR community works through uh, working groups. And as I mentioned, the AIR community, their whole function is to develop standards. So they produce these standards in the form of publications, which are ratified by the full AIR community. I'll just go through a few <clears throat> key publications here that are very foundational to the project. So um, there's My AIR, the minimal metadata standard for depositing AIRSeq data. This is something like 80 plus standardized fields. Uh, which uh, researchers use to actually curate the data. So when I mentioned at the beginning that I, I'm involved in data curation and sort of standardization, like I'm very familiar with all these 80 plus fields. Um, and then uh, beyond the metadata, there is an actual um, data representation standard. So an actual air.tsv file format to um, <clears throat> actually represent the rearrangements. And then there's an Air Data Commons API. This is a, a web API for actually exploring in an easy way um, the data that is um, within the Air Data Commons. So the Air Data Commons, I sort of speak of it as a single you know, database, but it's not really a single database. It's actually a distributed set of repositories. Um, so we have repositories that are in different, um, different, uh, several different countries. We actually have eight repositories at the moment. Um, but the idea is that they, the data within them is um, all AIR compliant. So it follows the AIR standards. And this allows them to effectively be connected um, and queryable so you can search across different um, AIR fields. Uh, so for example, different fields at the study level, the subject level, and the sample level. And the fact that these are um, distributed repositories rather than one big repository means that um, it's really easy to scale up um, these the, the AIR data commons. So right now I mentioned we have like eight repositories, but we envision having you know, tens to hundreds of repositories. And the whole um, be, uh, reason for being of the AIR Data Commons and iReceptor is to enable fair AIRSeq data. So data that's findable, accessible, interoperable, um, and can be ultimately reusable to drive new insights. And uh, just want to briefly go over the type of data in the ADC. So as I mentioned, this is not raw data. This is very uh, valuable process data that's been annotated um, and quality control sort of processes have already been done. So um, the researchers can basically take this data and go on their way and start analyzing it. So we have um, annotated uh, BCR and TCR rearrangements 
as well as those aggregated clone sequences that I discussed uh, from published studies. All the data is in the common um, air.tsv format. We also have um, different data that's been produced by those different sequencing approaches that I mentioned. So in the case of a bulk approach, the benefit there is that you get tons of sequences, like millions, billions of sequences. Whereas with a single cell approach, the benefit there is that you actually get uh, to preserve the, the full sort of chain pairing. So for an antibody where you have a heavy and light chain or a T cell where you have an alpha beta chain, um, these single cell approaches um, actually allow you to, to identify the intact receptor. Um, and some single cell approaches, um, such as the 10x immune profiling <clears throat> method, actually allow you to get another layer of data on top of this. And that's um, the gene expression or the transcriptome. And this type of data is important because it allows one to correlate uh, the receptor to the cell phenotype. So the actual uh, sort of biological function of the cell. So is it a cell that's in an activated state? You know, is it an immature cell? Is it a mature cell? Has it seen, I say, seen the um, antigen yet? So stuff like that. Um, and all of this data is associated with uh, metadata that is follows those MyAir standards and the data spans uh, multiple diseases and healthy controls. Okay, so now finally I can get to how iReceptor fits into here. Um, so I mentioned the Air Data Commons. You have these distributed AirSeq data repositories. Um, they're physically located in different uh, geographic locations. The iReceptor Scientific Gateway is actually a um, interactive web-based a uh, portal essentially that's sort of on top of, it's a layer that's on top of the um, Air Data Commons that allows users to very easily um, query the data in the Air, Air, Data, Air Data Commons with just a few, um, a few keystrokes and searches. And so with a single search, a user can actually um, search all the data in the Air Data Commons without having to deal with the fact that, you know, effectively it's all sort of split up in different repositories. And then the gateway uh, federates the data, which means that it combines it all in a nice, easy package for the user. And um, as well in a recent uh, release just earlier this year, we've now um, included the ability to perform complex analysis uh, right within the gateway on this data. So again, the gateway will um, actually do the analysis. So it'll manage the job. You, the user doesn't have to worry about that. And um, it'll present the results to the user in a very uh, user-friendly way. So basically to summarize here, iReceptor is sort of a layer on top of the Air Data Commons that allows users to easily interact with it. So I wanted to showcase here some use cases um, of iReceptor and the Air Data Commons. I have a few different examples. So in one case, let's say that you, you know, read a cool study in the literature and it maybe found an interesting finding or they reported an interesting or curious finding. Let's say you want to download that data and verify the results. Well, you can do that easily with um, iReceptor. You go to the gateway, download the data, and maybe you want to experiment with a few different um, methods. So you can, from that data, um, you can either repeat exactly the bioinformatic pipeline that the authors reported in their study, or perhaps you want to use an updated version of some tool that they used or perhaps you want to apply a more stringent quality control approach. And you want to see, you know, do I still get those same results with these changes? Um, another very common um, use case and a workflow that we've built into the gateway because it's so popular is looking for uh, particular clones. So in the, let's say you've done an experiment and you found that a particular clone is enriched um, in your condition under study. So if you want to find out, you know, have others found this clone present or enriched in this condition? Um, how about other conditions? 
and how about um, perhaps healthy individuals? So those are some really power, uh, important questions that with a few clicks, you can have that information um, at your fingertips. Um, another sort of use case is, um, let's say you did an, exper an AirSeq experiment, but you were not able to include control data. You know, these experiments are in AirSeq, they're very expensive. Um, so if you need some control data, you can head over to um, iReceptor and simply download some controls. And I'll show you how to do that in a um, little demo at the end. And a very sort of trendy topic right now is machine learning. So let's say um, you're interested in finding training data. Well, you can find that data easily um, if you want to build a machine model, for example, to identify disease uh, versus healthy samples or identify patients likely to respond to some particular drug. Um, the fact that there's so much of this data of this AirSeq data all um, annotated and um, prepared according to the same standards means that um, it's really set up well to do these M ML um, training procedures. Uh, okay, so finally, I can get into sort of how to navigate the platform. So um, ho hopefully some of you have already um, gone to the platform, played around, and I think gotten some accounts. So we have seen some user activity, which is awesome. Um, but just want to sort of go over how the gateway works. And a reminder that what it does is it searches the Air Data Commons, which at least at the time I took this uh, screenshot, was uh, comprised eight repositories, 86 studies, over 9,000 repertoires, and over 5 billion <clears throat> sequence annotations. And there's two workflows uh, that are sort of built into the gateway where you can browse that uh, metadata for all the studies, or you can do this uh, sequence quick search. So um, when you first go to the gateway and click on browsing all the, all the metadata, you see, um, just sort of the first few um, studies that are available, but obviously you're gonna want to filter this data. So you can apply any filters, there are multiple of them. You can use a, a full text search. You can filter by any um, study subject sample level fields. And these fields, just to let you know, are all of these air compliance um, fields that were used to initially curate the data. So as I said, there's over 80 of them. I don't have time, obviously, to really go into each of them, but they are all um, available and um, you can um, see for yourself. And um, I mentioned I was going to discuss how to find healthy controls. So in this case, uh, what I've done is I've, I've applied a filter on the study group level. This is sort of a standard keyword that we've um, integrated. So if you type in control, comma, healthy, uh, you'll find all of the healthy control data. You can see that <clears throat> it's uh, over 259, almost 260 million sequences from 222 repertoires across 12 studies. And if you click on uh, the statistics button, you can get some um, very high level, um, high value sort of um, uh, repertoire statistics, so looking at the V gene, D gene, J gene um, distributions, as well as the um, junction or uh, CDR3 length uh, amino acid distributions. So those sort of give you a good glance at the data, and then you might want to browse the sequences. So you can click on this button here. That opens up a window to um, look at the sequences. And again, at this point, you can apply further filters. So if you want to filter based off of any uh, VDJ gene or any particular length of the CDR3, you can do that at this point. And you can at this uh, juncture download the data. So you can see here with just a few clicks, you have all this data um, at your fingertips. It's coming from different studies, but it's all been um, annotated in the same uh, way and it's re really ready to go and analyze. Um, the other workflow that um, is built into the gateway is this a sequence quick search. 
So here I've taken a CDR3 amino acid sequence and say I found it from the literature, from a, a paper where it was mentioned, and I've searched uh, the Air Data Commons for that CDR3. And this result tells me that there's uh, over 74,000 sequences, uh, over 4,000 repertoires uh, from 24 studies from that, that this particular CDR3 is found. And what I want to highlight here um, is that a cool feature whereby um, the gateway simultaneously um, will query the IEDB, so the immune epitope database. And if that uh, CDR3 is reported in IEDB <clears throat> to be antigen specific, then the gateway will, will report that back to the users. So in this case, it's telling you that this CDR3 has specificity to other organisms. Um, and we also have the ability to browse um, clone level data. So remember, these are those sort of clonal uh, clusters. Um, like with the rearrangements, you have the VDJ calls and the um, CDR3 sequence. However, this is data that has undergone some level of aggregation. Um, so each row here represents a particular clone. You also have the um, clone count. So this is the number of members that are within that individual clone. And then you have the UMI count, which is the total frequency of, of uh, the total abundance of all of those clones. Um, and you can apply filters like before. And we also have a uh, workflow to browse cell data. So. Um, in our definition, a cell data refers to um, <clears throat> the, that multimodal approach I was discussing before, where you have um, a paired receptor, so shown here with chain one and chain two, as well as you have that extra layer of gene expression data. So here, what is being shown is just the top four um, genes that are expressed within a particular cell, with each row being one cell. Um, but this is just a fraction of the data. Um, we all like the the entire sort of gene expression matrix uh, for each cell is available. Um, and you can apply different filters. So for example, if you are interested in certain marker genes um, and you know a marker gene and you want one that's expressed very highly, then you can apply different um, numerical filters and filter, uh, so that you're you're only retaining those uh, cells of interest. And uh, I mentioned also with our new release, uh, iReceptor version 4.0, we now have included the ability to easily run analyses on this um, data. So you can now find data and analyze it all within the iReceptor gateway. So here I'm just showing um, a job that I ran called Cell Typist. So this particular job, um, it annotates the uh, cells based off of that gene expression data. So in this case, you can see it produces a UMAP plot showing um, all the different um, sort of uh, types of cells that were found in that repertoire. And this is based off of a, a machine learning algorithm. Uh, we did not develop this uh, program, but it's a it's a open source program, and we just we uh, were able to integrate it within the platform. So we have um, apps at the sequence and clone level. So I'll just give some some example output here. So you can get uh, VG, VJ gene usage heat maps. You can look at that um, junction uh, CDR3 amino acid length distribution. You can look at the top clones. Um, and different measures of um, those uh, clonality metrics that I was touching on before. And for cells, uh, this is um, a very sort of complicated looking uh, graph, but it's from a program called Conga, which um, works on T cells only actually. And it al allows uh, to cluster both the gene expression and the TCRs uh, simultaneously and look for um, significant uh, correlations between the clusters. And you saw before this uh, cell typist. Um, so 
I'll just wrap up at this point and say uh, thank you for the opportunity to share the um, iReceptor gateway and I'll acknowledge uh, my colleagues in the AIR community, our collaborators in the iReceptor Plus project, our various funders, and um, I have some links here. So if you haven't already, uh, please check out the gateway and uh, you can get an account just at the main login page. And if you're interested in contributing to the Air Data Commons, uh, if you happen to have any AirSeq data that you'd like to share, uh, get in touch with us at support at iReceptor.org. Thank you. Thanks, Kira. So questions? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take up everyone's time, but there's a lot of cool stuff that you covered, uh, Kira. Thank you so much. Um, maybe the, the best question, since you're here right now, is you were originally in plants, if I understand, and you got into immunology. How did that happen? <laughs> um, I mean, so my PhD project was, um, I actually started out in a wet lab, in a plant biology lab. And uh, I started out with a wet lab project. I think I wanted to, I don't know, I can only remember what it was, something about like finding the promoter sequence of a particular gene and how it was regulated. And after a year or so of just nothing working out and me becoming increasingly frustrated, um, my uh, supervisor had some data lying around that, um, we are actually, it was a very ambitious uh, project where without any, without really knowing anything, we just decided, or I guess previously they had decided to just do a massive RNA-seq uh, experiment, but nobody really knew how to analyze it. So I was just very frustrated with my project and um, my supervisor said, okay, why don't you just, you know, take a break and just see what you can do with this uh, data if you want to play around with it. So I basically was holed up in my room for, I don't know, a week or so and just decided that I really liked uh, bioinformatics. And my study there was um, all about um, the RNA-seq uh, transcriptome and looking at um, different genes that are involved in um, stress responses in this plant. And ultimately I um, ended up just uh, producing a draft um, genome assembly for the plant. So it's a it's a non-model plant that basically we there was no um, genomic resources or reference sequences yet available. So that ended up being my project was basically just creating these resources and how I moved into I guess the um, immune world is the fact that really once you know bioinformatics and you know the, the general principles of the of the analysis it's all the same like it's it doesn't really matter it, it's you know you might have to do a bit of reading um to sort of get the different biological processes and um i mean immune cells are pretty pretty wild um there's a lot of different cell types and i i find myself constantly googling to just remind myself about things um but yeah i, I would say if you're interested in bioinformatics, you can pretty much go anywhere. It doesn't matter the species uh, that you that you happen to to start on. Thank you. What plant? Oh, it's called pokeweed, <laughs> and um, it was uh, is interesting because it's uh, it's resistant to viral infection, except for this one um virus called uh pokeweed mosaic virus um it, that's basically the only virus that's able to infect the plant hmm. i can see why that would be interesting yeah and actually so the plant does produce um antiviral proteins creatively called pokeweed antiviral protein <laughs> um and um it's uh that protein um it's a um, it inhibits um, RNA, or no, it causes RNA depurination, and it basically inhibits protein synthesis, and it's been used, or it's been tested at least for its um, uh, in inhibitory activity against viruses such as HIV, um, and so animal viruses as well as plant viruses. 
So yeah, wow. pretty cool. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. Um, it's I'm just kind of blown away <laughs> by all the data. Yeah, I can I can comment. You know, I I found it very easy to uh, to get to some of these data sets and and got a few to you know kind of help us in the hackathon. I thought it was interesting because you know it's um, you know NCBI you can get the straight sequence data. You can do an IG blast. You get a nice big table with ninety six AIRR columns. Um, yeah. and then your data sets there's like one hundred and thirty columns in them. So you know got the eighty plus you have more data. Um, but they're not all used in all data sets, right? So um, yeah. it's kind of, you know, um, so, you know, the level of annotation is going to vary uh, between groups, I assume. That's a great point. Yeah. So we encourage, so we make the field available. Mm -hmm. We say, we like to say that um, all the fields are important, but not all of them are required. So of these you know, 80 or 80 plus fields, there are only a handful that are actually required. Um, but, you know, really the whole, if you're, if you're um, depositing your data into the Air Data Commons, you obviously care about, you know, potential reuse of your data. And the more information that you can annotate um, and provide, even though it does take some time, then the, the more likely that your data will be uh, beneficial for researchers and will be reused. And we we actually have a fair amount of publications where researchers have found data data sets in their data commons. They've downloaded them, they've reused them, and they cite um, both us, iReceptor, and they cite you know those studies. So cool. yeah. Are Are there any efforts underway to you know because there's a lot more data than than is in iReceptor, right? Yep. And, and getting after a lot of that data and reprocessing it to get it into the commons. Cause I, I think there's, you know, there's unpublished things in that have been deposited in SRA yep. uh, from real studies. Yeah, so uh, um, it's a great question. And we actually did sort of start out that way. So a lot of the um, first, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 studies in the Air Data Commons were um, prior to me, they were other data curators who actually had the, um, you know, painful job, uh, I would say, of going back to the SRA, downloading the data, following the quality control uh, procedures and processing that the actual paper itself um, reported. So trying to follow the methods that researchers had, you know, used and basically reverse engineering those studies to sort of prime the pump, as they say, to get the data in the ADC to sort of show its value. And um, as you can imagine, that's a very labor intensive process. Um, and I've only had to do it a few times because actually since COVID, um, we really found that, or we were really trying to sort of optimize um, how we work and we find that we can get way more data in the Air Data Commons by working directly with researchers. So that's sort of part of my role I was speaking to in the beginning about the whole consulting, where you know we'll we'll re we'll reach out to to different research groups. We'll say, hey, we notice you have a lot of AirSeq data. Are you interested in working with us to um, get this data in the Air Data Commons? You know, we can sort of help you uh, get get you up to speed with all the all the information you need. We can review your data, your metadata, sort of give, give you like the process that's needed and basically just help, we enable researchers to get their data in there. It's, we find that it's a lot more efficient. Sure, do you, do you run into uh, challenges with that in terms of kind of selling the researchers on the concept of their data being reused? I think one of the challenges is, is the, the overall you know, kind of academic currency, the citation on papers, not the citations on data. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that we, there's been, you know, many times where we've re reached out to groups and um, some very big groups that do have AirSeq data, but for whatever reason, they they don't have the time or interest or whatever, uh, and they're not interested in contributing. So um, that's why we, 
we like to, you know, get the word out on how va valuable this data is and how valuable it is to really uh, share this data so that others can reuse it. Yeah. Boy, if they Wait. could benefit from reusing their own data, that would be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess they have their own, those groups sort of have their own, you know, internal processes and stuff, but right. yeah, it's all about just, you know, playing well with others and uh, together, you know, you can go further. Do you, do you have a way to let researchers know when their data has been reused? It seems like that would be something they would want to be able to say. Um, so we actually don't right now, but we, that's one thing that we've been, uh, we, that has been tossed around as an idea is to sort of like put metrics associated with each, uh, data set. So you can say, you know, this study has been, um, downloaded this many times, this study has been mm -hmm. cited this many times. Um, like you say, just sort of like those badges and, um, stuff like that, but we haven't yet implemented, um, something like that, but mm -hmm. It's definitely, definitely been discussed. Yeah, you know, it's, I think beyond the scope of, of this hackathon, just because, you know, today's sort of the last working day, but um, I was intrigued by the control data, right? Because you can, you can, okay, give me all the control, everything's oh. annotated, control in the data set. And you have all these different labs and repositories. And so the question I was thinking is, is like, what would the global analysis look like in terms of clonality and bias that yeah. you might find um, laboratory to laboratory? which would reflect probably the populations that they're getting the data from. Yep. We, we yeah. have a... hmm? Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say that's a, that's a question that we really would love to, uh, to explore. And I mean, if, if that's a, a question of interest for, for your group and there's any members here who, who want to tackle that? Um, yeah, I mean, we would love to love to hear your findings. Okay. No, it's great. I mean, well, you know, because part of our mission here is to develop um, course-based undergraduate research projects in antibody engineering, and so you know, some of these would be really great bioinformatics uh, research projects. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, we so we have a request, and I know I don't want to take up too much of your time, but. Maybe this is something you could do. Mm -hmm. And the request is if you could do a demonstration of searching at eye receptor, like for, um, I don't know, something with, um, say, a repertoire from ovarian cancer. Um, okay, let me pull up. So do you see the, do you see my screen right now? Okay. Can you, can you start so, from like the very beginning? So if I, yes. what, if I did a Google search and I got there, what would, what would I do? <laughs> so are you saying sort of that you have a particular uh, CDR3 sequence perhaps that, or you want to find ovarian cancer? Specific? Ovarian cancer metadata, yeah. Okay, so in that case, I would go to browse uh, the repertoire metadata. We've been having some issues where the gateway is very slow, so apologies in advance. Um, That's so my fault. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's all tied. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go down to subject. I'm going to go to diagnosis. Um, what was the? Oh, uh, ovarian. Yeah, ovarian cancer. Let's see. There we go. Well, it looks like you got a different. You got several different types of uh, cancer to choose from. Let's just click. Yeah, look at that. Um, and then I'm going to say apply. Alrighty, so we end up with 66,357 sequences uh, from 39 repertoires. Oh, and they're all from one study. So um, they're from this study. Usually if you click on that, it'll take you to the study there. So yeah, I guess we don't have that much, but um, it's from this 2020 study. Um, yeah, so, and then if you wanted, so this is just showing the metadata. Again, if you want to actually browse those sequences, 
I see an answer to one of the questions I was going to ask about sorting on columns, but I see the up and down arrow, so oh, that answers yeah. it right there. Yeah. And I see you've got some in there that are benign and some that are tumors. So I suppose you could sort. Yeah, so if you wanted to, um, let me go back. Oh, and you can use the, the pie charts too, that's neat. No, unfortunately, uh, they're not interactive. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's, right, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a survey, uh, post the yeah. survey link in, in Slack so that we okay. can all comment on the pie charts. Yes. You can all yell at Brian to tell him that these pie charts need to be interactive. That would be great. <laughs> Brian is actually here listening. Oh, Brian. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Brian. Hey, Brian. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yell at Brian for the pie chart. And, and I hear you. <laughs> um, anything, or let's see what else I can do here. Um, if we want to go back to looking at those sequences. Um, so here's a few of the jobs that are available. So from this data, if you just want to get sort of high level fast, you can see now the gateway is managing the job. Um, takes a bit of time, but the, um, what else? If you want to filter by any particular gene, let's say, uh, see what that does. Yeah, so I didn't realize Brian was here. So that if, if anybody has any more technical questions, uh, Brian would be able to help out there. Well, may, maybe I do while we're waiting. Yeah. Um, is it possible to bring data from the outside into iReceptor to do some comparative analysis with results from iReceptor data? Or is it the other way? You take it out and do your extern analysis external to iReceptor. Do you want me to answer that, Kira? Sure. Yeah, so, so we have a repository software stack that um, I would encourage people who want to share their data to give it a try. It's basically a database um, that stores data in the, in the uh, error compliant formats. Um, so we're trying to make it easy for researchers to share their data by managing their own data. So that's the way to, to get data in the Air Data Commons. Mm -hmm. We don't allow people to update or upload data into our repositories, mostly because it, it, there's, we just couldn't handle the scale. There's too much data. Um, I, I saw the um, control data, and I'm wondering if um, maybe it doesn't make sense to bring data from a, a study to utilize your control data and use your analysis software to do comparative analysis. Or does it make more sense to take that control data out of iReceptor to do the analysis? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And it, it's kind of a, it, it's a challenging one. I mean, ideally, you'd be able to do it in the platform, like if you have some data. But like I say, we we don't we we can't handle um, the volume of data that people would have if we allowed people to update okay. upload data. Um, so unfortunately, so we we integrate pretty common tools that are widely used, I guess. Um, in particular, more on the single cell side. Um, and so you could take data out of the Air Data Commons and use those same tools that we use inside the gateway to compare data. Um, that means that you, the whole the whole goal of having those analysis tools is we're trying to make it so you don't have to be a bioinformatician and a computer expert to install software on your computer and run it. Um, and so we don't solve that problem in that kind of use case, unfortunately. Although I, I'd say you know it's there's still a there's still a, a barrier to get over to becoming that bioinformatician, but the barrier is getting smaller with you know, the way we're teaching bioinformatics use of Jupyter notebooks and chat GPT and, and, and resources like that. So, um, yeah, I could even see a concept where you, you could have your, your methods published. There's a page like, okay, we're using these R routines. Here's how, here's, here's that block of code. I could then take that and modify it for my data or combine some data sets, you know, things like that. So kind of thinking about how, how the world's changing in this respect, right? 
Yeah, our analysis tools are are all Docker containers. There you go. So, yeah. so you, you could conceivably pull the Docker container that we use in our analysis pipeline and feed it our data and feed it your data. And yeah, nominally you should, that should work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then all you have to do is figure out your resources. Are the Docker containers available on Docker store or where, where are they? Uh, they're available on Docker hub. Okay. Yeah, if you search for iReceptor as an organization, uh, you will see the containers there. That's great. Well, neat. I think we have time maybe for one more question. All right. I always have questions if you want to hang out. <laughs> I don't want to take up all your time, though. OK, Keith, one more. <laughs> I, I ran into something in BioPython. I think it was called Ntrends, and that has access to a, just a slew of databases. Um, do you know if Ntrends has access to your database? I do not. Yeah. Is there an API that we can connect to? There it is. Um, so the Air Data Commons has an API. Uh, and in fact, that's what the the gateway uses to communicate with all the data repositories. Mm -hmm. So in the Air Data Commons, uh, at a high level, if you go to the gateway, it'll say there's nine repositories, but there's actually physically about 15 databases. Um, mm -hmm. Each of those databases um, implements the Air Data Commons API. Mm -hmm. And so you can query the repositories as a user from a piece of Python code or with curl from the command line and things like mm -hmm. that if you wanted to. Um, and that's exactly what the gateway is doing. The gateway is just using the ADC API for those repositories. So it's doing all the federation across 15 databases okay. and all that kind of stuff for you. But there is an API at a very low level that you can use to query repositories yourself. Yeah, because I think BioPython's entrance is also utilizing other databases API for querying. Okay, cool. Thank you. Well, thanks again. Clap, yeah. virtual claps. <laughs> we really you. appreciate this. I'm going to turn the recording off.